Hello everyone, good evening. Um, hopefully people can hear me loud and clearly. Um, hopefully that's all clear. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all this evening to the first What It Takes uh, talk, which is held, hosted by the alumni. So uh, thanks to the alumni for putting this event on. Um, this is the first event in the year of What It Takes series featuring uh, alumni speaking to current students and to recent graduates so someone is speaking from your cohort which is a uh, which is always great to to have that happen uh, just to let you know who i am my name is justin haroon and i am the director at the center for resilience at the university of westminster so we have a center for resilience at the university of westminster we work with organizations uh, leadership teams so we've worked with teams like microsoft uh, Ofcom, Rail Delivery Group, PricewaterhouseCooper, and many more. We also teach junior doctors. We work in the NHS, and we also work with the students and the student body at the university. So there's lots of work that we do there, and we've lots of projects. So keep your eye, eyes out for some of those projects. And if if you're inspired after today and you want to get involved, um, feel free to email me and uh, connect. Before I introduce our speaker for this evening. Um, I just want to cover some housekeeping. So this talk is being recorded. Uh, it will be edited and made available on YouTube when it's ready, and we're going to send you the link so you can you can watch it again. Or if there's anything you, you want to kind of recover, re, re, recount, then you can do that as well. Uh, your microphones and your cameras are automatically turned off just to make things a bit clearer. Uh, but live chat is on, so um, that's there for you to ask questions. And you can ask questions as you go, and we'll, we'll gather those questions and the data as we as we move forward. And that will give us a chance that at the end of the session, I will ask questions to Anastasia. Um, so you can you can you can chat to uh, to us in in the, in the live chat feed. I am really delighted delighted to announce uh, our alumni speaker for today's talk, Anastasia Vinikova will be sharing her insights into what it takes to develop resilience and also to stay motivated. So Anastasia graduated from Westminster in 2014 with a BA in business management, specialising in human resource, resources management. Uh, she is the wellbeing lead at the Bank of England and is a former member of the Commission for Equality in Mental, Hair, in mental Health and a co-chair of the thriving from the start network which is a mental health network for those early on in their careers or about to finish their studies and transition into the world of work so last year anastasia also founded um, winning minds a mental health resource for sports in this talk anastasia is going to look at how rather than always being positive and strong which is often a kind of theme around resilience actually acknowledging your vulnerability uh, can be a key part of developing resilience so i'm really looking forward to hearing that because it's something that i'm really passionate about too uh, she is also going to help you to identify some common challenges to motivation and resilience such as things like peer pressure job hunts social pressure and toxic prof professionalism interestingly i was talking about that with some students uh, just this week so the talk will include where to look for support and the importance of building support networks as Anastasia brings her personal and professional experience together to advise you guys, our students and the graduates. Uh, so Anastasia is going to do a talk first and then post some questions and I'll put your questions to her. So with great pleasure, I'd like to pass over now to Anastasia. Really looking forward to this talk. So over to you, Anastasia. Hi, Justin. Um, thank you so much. I'm hoping that um, everyone uh, can see me OK um, so, and, and hear me OK as well. That's the, that's the most important. Um, so I'm just going to um, get some, some slides up. So thank you so much for um, having me today. Um, I uh, was uh, I don't know if it's a positive or a negative thing that uh, this is the first in the series of what it takes uh, sessions that you've got. Um, it means that uh, hopefully I can set the bar um, and there's not too much uh, pressure on me to kind of um, follow any acts but um, I'm hoping that it will be an enjoyable and useful session for you all. 
So um, Justin did such a fantastic job of introducing me that I feel like my first slide um, is redundant, um, but um, I will just kind of um, walk through a little bit um, about me. So I, study, I studied at Westminster. Um, I would kind of describe myself as a mental health advocate. I'm very, very passionate about mental health and wellbeing. Um, and what that kind of looks like is, um, you know, really just kind of personal experience um, as wellbeing leader at the Bank of England. Um, I worked on the Commission for Equality and Mental Health, which looked at providing recommendations to lots of societal structures around how do we actually make sure that mental health support and care is accessible for everyone. Um, and I used to be a competitive figure skater, which is, um, I think, usually an interesting fact um, to share, because I think that the kind of sporting world has given me um, a really, really interesting insight into things like resilience, motivation. But it also prompted me to found Winning Minds last year, which is an online resource for sports people, just acknowledging that actually it can be really, really challenging to understand your own mental health and kind of, uh, you know, educate yourself around mental health when you are in the world of sport where, you know, things can be a little bit more skewed. Um, lots of the, the reason why, you know, I, I work in the mental health space and in the wellbeing space and why I'm keen to do sessions like this and why I was really, really delighted to be invited to talk about resilience and motivation is because um, I have personal experience of mental ill health. So I have an anxiety disorder. Um, I've suffered from depression um, and both of those things, unfortunately, have been characterised by disordered eating in the past. So, um, you know, I think those are difficult experiences that I've been through, but with hopefully sort of, um, you know, the, the beneficial outcome is that I can share some of those experiences and some insight into that. Um, and, um, you know, uh, hopefully kind of um, uh, that will be helpful for you. I wanted to kind of um, explain before I kick off that as we run through the session, where we're going to look at, you know, the concept of resilience and uh, motivation. Firstly, that given my background and given kind of the experiences um, that I've had and that you can see on the screen there, there is a bit of a mental health angle to what I'm talking about. Um, and hopefully that that resonates with lots of people on the session. But also that I, I am keen as we go through the session to kind of share some of the experiences um, that I've had. Um, not because I want to talk about myself, you know, for, for the next hour and a bit, but actually because I think that storytelling is incredibly powerful. Um, you know, I think that we um, benefit from understanding each other's experiences. Um, and when we share, hopefully when we share something difficult, it makes it a little bit easier for the next person to also share something that might be difficult for them. So as I kind of inject some of my personal experiences into the session today, please be assured that it's coming from a place of kind of the belief that storytelling is a very powerful tool. So just um, kind of getting started, I suppose the first thing that I wanted to do was acknowledge that um, perhaps for those of you on the call, um, if you've joined this session, which is, you know, looking at finding motivation and developing resilience, it might be because you feel yourself that that's something that you're lacking at the moment. Um, and I hope that that's, you know, a, a safe assumption to make. What I would say, though, is that it's incredibly important to pause and just acknowledge the fact that things have been quite rubbish recently. Um, and that might be in the context of the pandemic. It might be in the context of anything else that you've got going on that has made you feel like you need some extra motivation, that you need to develop some resilience. And I think that that acknowledgement of, you know, actually, I'm looking around me right now, things feel really rubbish, you know, is important because we, we spend a lot of time chasing silver linings when actually that's not always helpful. Sometimes we need to just pause, stop, and think, okay, I'm in the situation, I acknowledge that, now let's have a think about what I can do to kind of improve that situation for myself. So I just wanted to kind of reflect on that because I think that it's a really, really important piece. I also wanted to kind of um, take a step back and look at the bigger picture and kind of have a, have a little bit of a think around mental health and wellbeing. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons that I wanted to do that is as I've mentioned, because of my background, I think the mental health and well-being are so important. And I think they're really, really inter kind of, you know, sectored with conversations about resilience. We can't think about resilience unless we have to think about mental health and well-being. And the thing about mental health and well-being is that the scope of the conversation has really changed. So if we think about five years ago, 10 years ago, what societal um, you know, attitudes were like towards mental health, we've really, really come on leaps and bounds. That means that things have changed. 
and for the better there's lots of successes that we can kind of you know count lots more high profile individuals sharing their experiences of mental ill health um, you know, lots more support available, institutions like universities providing more frameworks of education and support around mental health. But at the same time, something that's happened is that the goalposts have changed. So when we first started talking about mental health, no one was talking about it. So there was just that kind of initial goal of let's just get somebody talking about it. Just, just you know, whoever it is, let's just, somebody needs to talk about it. And we've got past that barrier. And what we need to understand is actually that, you know, there are new complexities different demographics, different communities have very different experiences of mental health and well-being. Even if we think about kind of recent history and some of the things that we've been through, not just talking about the pandemic, but different kind of economic, social, political changes, they're all complex and they're all going to have an impact on our own psychological well-being. And all of that kind of compounded also means that there's lots of structural stuff that's going on that means that there's lots of health inequalities and what that means is that we're not all going through the same mental health journey and that's really important and and we'll touch on that a little bit later specifically in the context of you so you as either students or those that have left education not too long ago maybe you're in the first few years of your career maybe you are on the job search um there are some really really important complexities that are worth acknowledging within your own context which might be impacting your mental health and subsequently how resilient you feel and how motivated you feel. But on that, what I wanted to kind of first talk about is almost take kind of another step backwards and talk about, you know, mental health. What is mental health? Very often when we talk about mental health, we use it as a synonym to mental illness. So there's this idea that if we're talking about mental health, we must exclusively be talking about people who have a diagnosed mental health condition. Of course, you know, I think it's important to recognise that that's not the case. And I would encourage you all to have a think about mental health as a spectrum. So hopefully you can see this very <laughs> simple diagram on the screen, which is called the mental health spectrum. And every single one of us on this call will sit somewhere on this spectrum. And it's also not static. So you might be somewhere on the spectrum today and somewhere else on this spectrum, um, you know, tomorrow, next week, the next month. Um, and so, you know, you might be someone who has a mental illness, you maybe you've been diagnosed with mental illness, but you could be right at the top with optimal mental health. So you've learned to manage your condition, um, you know, things are going well, you feel good, you're up there. Equally, you may never be diagnosed with mental illness, but you could be right at the bottom of the scale and experience poor mental health. And that's part of life. Uh, there's nobody that sits right at the top of men optimal mental health all the time. If you do, then you must be one of the luckiest people in the world because life is stressful. Things happen. We often can't control those things. Um, and, you know, it can be anything from stress about university, stress at work, stress at home. It could be a life event that happens, a bereavement that we experience. So we move around on this spectrum. And the concept of resilience, I think, is very, very important to consider when we think about this spectrum, because whether you're somewhere at the bottom and you're experiencing poor mental health, resilience and motivation are concepts that can help to bring you back up to that optimal space. Equally, you might be somewhere up at the top in that optimal space and things are happening. You know, maybe things have been good, you'll feel really fantastic, but life events are happening, things are getting stressful. It can be that concept of resilience that can help you to stay kind of above that bar and to stay in that somewhere in that positive mental health space rather than slipping down into the poor mental health. So hopefully what that illustrates is that, you know, how we feel is an ever changing thing. It's not static, but also the idea that, um, you know, resilience, I think, as a concept is really, really important, uh, regardless of, of, you know, where you are on this scale, because it comes in handy regardless of where you might sit. Now, I mentioned that I wanted to talk about kind of you as a demographic and some, some you know, something that as whether you're a student um, or whether you've just finished university or whether you're a couple of years into your career, something that's important to consider. So those complexities that we were talking about, um, you know, are, are really pertinent for the demographic of young people. 
because over the last couple of years, really, really interesting, there's been this huge increase in the amount of research that's being done about the mental health of young people, and specifically looking at that population of those that are coming to the end of their educational journey, all the way up to being sort of three, four, five years um, into their first kind of job and, and into their careers. And the findings are upsetting, I think. Um, there was uh, a re report with uh, research by YouGov, Bupa and the City Mental Health Alliance that was re uh, launched yesterday, actually. And there's some really staggering stuff in there. So they spoke to over a thousand respondents, young people who are either coming to the end of their educational journey or in the first couple of years of their career. And 72 percent of the respondents said that they had experienced poor mental health in the last 12 months. If you think about that, 72 percent, that's a huge proportion. And if you think about that in the context of this call, for example, there's over 100 people on this call. That's a lot of us that will have experienced poor mental health. Also of respondents, 11% had experienced an eating disorder, 17% had had suicidal thoughts, and one in 50 had attempted suicide. Again, you know, it's absolutely staggering because if we think about that in the context of the amount of people that we have on this session today, that's really sad. Um, in the context of the workplace, 8% had used annual leave to cover up that they had been struggling with their mental health rather than asking for sick leave or saying that they needed some time to recover. 61% said that their poor mental health affected their ability to do their job. And actually, this is, you know, this study isn't the first of its kind. There was also a study uh, about two years ago now by Deloitte who found that actually within workforces, it's specifically young people and organisations who are most susceptible to mental health. Now, on the face of it, I appreciate that these statistics might seem very doom and gloom, and I'm absolutely not here to kind of, you know, make things um, difficult or to kind of, you know, upset anybody. But I think that there's there's kind of the flip side of, of these statistics, which is that if there's something on the screen that resonates with you, the likelihood is that if you think about the young people around you, whether it's people on your course, whether it's fellow alumni who graduated at the same time as you, whether it's your friend groups, people in your family, people that you interact with at work that are of a similar demographic, if you're feeling that you are struggling with your mental health, that can be a very isolating thing. And it can be very easy to look at the people around you and think, why are they happy and I'm not? The reality is many of them might be going through the same thing that you are, but they might not feel that they can talk about it. So it's this idea that you're not alone if this is something that you're experiencing and that, you know, it's, it's important to recognise that because of the isolating nature of, of mental ill health. Um, and I think that the encouraging thing as well is that there are lots of organisations, not just workplaces, but universities. This is a good example. This session, you know, does have a really, really significant kind of mental health angle to it. Lots of institutions are thinking about what do we actually do to provide support and provide education awareness about how people can access support. So hopefully, if you're in this category of somewhere in this, you know, in, in these statistics, what you'll get out of this session as well is, again, a feeling that you're not alone. There are lots of people that might be feeling similarly to you, but also we'll talk a little bit about kind of support networks and things like that um, a little bit later in the presentation. So in the context of that, what what actually is resilience because i suppose you know that if we're going through kind of a period of poor mental health resilience is the thing that we're told to look for we we want to find resilience so that we can get through kind of difficult times the dictionary defines resilience either as the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties toughness or the ability of a substance or object to spring back into shape elasticity um, and we can you know think about what does that look like kind of in people um, and I think that that gives us a good idea of, you know, what is it that we actually associate with resilience? Um, but I think that there's also, um, you know, two important factors here. Firstly, that resilience might mean different things to different people. I know that there's an agreed definition. I know that there's kind of this dictionary definition. But depending on the context of your circumstances, your resilience might look different to somebody else's resilience. And that might depend on the circumstances that you're in the type of person that you are and there's also a recognition which i think is so so important particularly if anyone is anxious uh, as, as a human being like i am um there's this recognition that actually we can't always control difficult circumstances or events that happen to us but what we can try to control is our approach to trying to overcome them and i think that's important because you know again just to kind of share a bit of my own experience um 
I think a lot of my anxiety and a lot of the kind of solution to anxiety that I feel that I, you know, I wouldn't say that I'm cured of my anxiety disorder, but I think I manage it quite well now, is that I, I really had to reset my brain to understand that I, I can't control bad things happening because that's life. Um, but what I can try and control is my response to them, both from kind of a psychological and emotional point of view, but also in kind of the actions that I take if something does happen. Um, so I think that that's that's a really important um, uh, recognition. But here's uh, maybe where uh, I'm saying something controversial, particularly uh, with with obviously Justin uh, chairing the session. I hope that I won't get in trouble for this um, uh, later. But I don't always love the concept of resilience or I don't love the definition that we attribute to resilience because toughness is, you know, this idea that we can't be vulnerable. And, you know, when you think of toughness, it's a constant. We are always tough we you know take things to heart and we can get through anything and really often the kind of societal definition of resilience seems to make it feel like it's our responsibility to just get on with it something difficult has happened show resilience just be tough get over it you know and i think that that's not helpful and i think that that's why it's important that we consider the importance of vulnerability before we get onto the conversation around, well, you know, how do you develop resilience? How do you, you know, make yourself have this toughness? I think it's really important to consider that I don't think that being a strong person means that you have to have an absence of vulnerability. Vulnerability, when you think about it, is such a raw and such a human experience. I think it's, you know, powerful even to, to have those experiences. So why would we want to have a life that's absent of them? I also think that vulnerability can help us understand the world around us, but also to develop compassion and empathy, which I think is so crucial when we build connections with other people, um, you know, when we build um, our support networks, that kind of compassion and empathy can be really important. And I think that that comes from a place of experiencing that vulnerability and having, I think, you know, the, the strength to share those vulnerabilities with others and invite other people to share vulnerabilities with us. I think that it's also a really big part of um, authenticity. I think if you allow yourself to have vulnerable moments, you learn about yourself and you can learn to accept yourself as a whole um, you know, person. Um, and I think that you know, the stress of concealing parts of you is also incredibly um, you know, pressured. Um, so accepting your whole self and then thinking about how you can bring that, whether it's into um, your academic life or into the workplace is incredibly important as well. My own personal observation and, and something that I feel quite strongly about is, is one of the issues is that we don't really see a lot of vulnerability in senior people, in leaders, whether that is when we think about our politicians, whether that's when we think about, you know, um, CEOs, successful people uh, within businesses, if you're in a workplace, you know, people who are in senior leadership. But in reality, I think it's really, really important that we do see their vulnerabilities because if if they're not human they're incredibly difficult to relate to and then it's very you know difficult to either build relationships or to imagine that you yourself could be in a position like that because you know it's, it's for people who aren't vulnerable and if you embrace your vulnerability you know how do you fit into into those roles um and i think you know again just kind of you know injecting some of my own personal experience i think that the most connected and strong that i felt particularly with other people um is is when i've been able to share my vulnerabilities and i've also been incredibly empowered by experiences where senior colleagues have shared theirs um and i think you know one of the things that um really prompted a big turnaround for me with my mental health was actually understanding and seeing senior colleagues who shared their own experiences. So um, I was about 17 when I started to realise I had something wrong with my mental health, but at the time, um, and it wasn't that long ago, um, I, well, I'm, I'm telling myself that because um, I, I want to be young forever. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, when I was at school, there was no education uh, around mental health. I, I didn't really understand what it was i didn't know what it meant to have a mental illness and i had a very kind of stereotypical hollywood view of what would happen if i told somebody that i was struggling with my mental health you know i was thinking straight to a psychiatric hospital you know a straight jacket 
padded rooms and then that would be my life forever. So I decided that I wouldn't tell anybody that I was struggling. The result of that was that I didn't seek help for a very long time. I was ashamed of what I was going through. I didn't think anybody else was going through the same thing because when I looked at my peers, everyone seemed really happy, everyone seemed really successful, everyone seemed to have a really buzzing social life. And I just didn't understand why I was different. And I thought, well, if I just pretend and I don't tell anyone, maybe that will be what my life will be like too. And obviously the reality is that putting off treatment for any health condition, whether it's physical or psychological, is not beneficial because you tend to get worse. And it was when I came to the bank for the first time, you know, in half a decade of struggling with poor mental health, that I felt sufficiently empowered to go and not just seek more regular help. I had, you know, had some help before that, but seek regular help and to get into a really good cycle of therapy, but also to start telling people. And it was literally just, you know, that when I had come to the bank, there were senior managers that had written blogs and posted videos and spoken at events about their experiences with a whole range of mental health challenges. And I thought, well, they're a senior manager, they've done really well for themselves. They, you know, are completely open about these things that are so raw and intimate, personal, and vulnerable. Maybe it's OK if I start telling people about it because, you know, that, that they've not experienced negative stigma. They still have, you know, fulfilled lives, fulfilled careers. And, you know, the, the most positive surprise that I've ever had in my life is that although I found it absolutely terrifying, when I did start telling people at work and at home and, you know, within my social circle, it really, really did make a huge difference because people were very accepting. Lots of people reached out and said, I've gone through the same thing. I thought I was the only one. So I think that, you know, if you can find someone that you can kind of um, resonate with um, that is sharing their experiences, it can empower you to do the same. And you sort of set off a bit of a snowball effect. Um, I think, though, that obviously, you know, there is a, a personal kind of aspect to it in that we may not all want to share our vulnerabilities. It might just depend on the kind of person you are and the preferences that you have. So I'm not suggesting that we have to go around and share absolutely every aspect of our lives with absolutely everyone. But I think that there are definitely small moments, you know, when you connect with people, whether that's in the workplace or kind of in your personal life, where you have moments to share little bits of things that might be kind of vulnerabilities and understand, you know, is that person receptive to that? Do you feel comfortable sharing those things? And then you build up connections where actually you have that kind of reciprocal sharing, which I think is really important. But that role modeling piece, I think, is so, so important. And, you know, if, if it's not something you want to share at this stage, when you go on and kind of reach where you want to reach within your career, it's something to think about when you come into a leadership position about the importance, um, you know, for, for, for the people that, that might be looking up to you. So kind of moving back on to um, resilience and, and motivation kind of as, as concepts, there's lots of barriers and obstacles to, to the concept of resilience and motivation. And I think we have to kind of think about what they are because very often it's so, so overwhelming to, um, you know, if you're feeling demotivated, if you're feeling that you don't have resilience and you'd like to develop some, it's a very overwhelming concept to say, well, I must just get some motivation from somewhere. Or I must become resilient. And identifying some of the obstacles and barriers that we see to that, I think, is important. It might be that you have a life event, something happens to you and that just, you know, really knocks you and that affects your motivation. And quite often, um, you know, what tends to happen, you know, sod's law, something happens and then lots more things happen at the same time. And it can feel like loads of things are happening to you at the same time. So there might be events that happen to you that stop you from feeling motivated, that stop you from feeling resilient. There's also regular stresses, you know, things that happen throughout life. Um, which are just, you know, whether that's while you're studying, steady stream of coursework, maybe looming exams, maybe it's um, financial stresses, maybe it's stresses within your personal life, maybe something is going on within your family, maybe something's going in within your social group, maybe there are things kind of externally in the political space which are causing you some anxiety. So there are kind of things that stress us through life, um, which I think, you know, do... Um, impact how resilient and motivated we feel but I think the kind of you know next few that I'm going to talk about are 
particularly impactful and I think they impact people throughout their lives generally um, but I think that it is also something that can be particularly challenging if you are kind of you know um, going through that transition period of leaving education and entering the workplace so things like fear of failure or even fear of success so are you so driven to think about you know how dreadful it would be if things didn't go how you would like them to that you can't find the motivation to get started because you're so terrified of what will happen if whatever that is that you're working on isn't going to end you know the way that you'd like it to equally it's a really interesting concept but there's lots of people who have a fear of success so if you're successful in what you're endeavoring to do what does that mean um, you know what what's what's the impact of that what what happens next what's the project after that does that catapult you to somewhere where you don't feel comfortable you know it, it's either because it feels like an unknown or perhaps you know you you don't like um, kind of the the feeling of the pressure of you have to move quickly on to the next thing whatever it might be um, you know are you afraid of, of what that outcome looks like it's also um, really really important um, to, to consider imposter syndrome so might be something that lots of you are familiar with, but the concept of imposter syndrome is um, essentially where you feel like you're a fraud. Um, and we see it a lot kind of in, in the transition period. So maybe you've got to university and you think it's only a matter of time before someone knows that I, I don't belong here. Um, you know, I shouldn't have got in here. I don't know. It was a fluke. I don't know how I got here. And you see it a lot in the workplace as well. You're, you're waiting to be found out. You feel like you don't deserve to be there. And that you're just pretending you know you're faking it till you're making it but you're still in that faking it phase and you know that's incredibly stressful um and you know i think it's really 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 interesting because that is definitely kind of a very universal experience um i recently thriving from the start held an event which was around imposter syndrome and we had the global chair of deloitte you know what a job title phenomenal phenomenal career and uh she, she called sharon thorn she was ex she was explaining that she has dreadful imposter syndrome even now um and you know so if you think about the fact that whether you're at the start of your career or you have kind of you know what you would think is enough solid things under your belt to to not make you feel like an imposter you can still experience that so i think it's just a very human um thing um and toxic perfectionism so this one's interesting because uh, there was a researcher at the lse who found that perfectionism generally as a personality trait seems to be more common in younger people so previous generations don't seem to have it as much um as as a personality trait and the thing with perfectionism is that if it's toxic or if it's unhealthy it's this idea that you set very, very high bars for yourself, unachievable goals, because you feel that that's the level of perfection that you would want to be at. But if you fall even a little bit short of that, then it's very, very impactful on your psychological well-being. There's also with toxic perfectionism, this idea that even if you have achieved the exact thing that you wanted to, you will go back and nitpick every tiny thing that went wrong, even if it was a success. You won't celebrate the achievements that you make and you will move straight on to the next huge high achieving thing that you want to get to. And it's a very stressful state to constantly be in because if you don't pause, if you don't celebrate, you're constantly on the go and you're constantly feeling like you're not reaching that bar that you're setting for yourself. And of course, there are lots of other obstacles and barriers to to feeling resilient, to feeling motivated. And the thing that's really, really important to identify and hopefully why, um, you know, I'm conscious that this might seem um, broad or vague, but it's so personal to you as an individual and to the set of circumstances and contexts that you find yourself in, um, that it's very, very difficult to go through every possible obstacle and barrier that you might be experiencing, which is impacting how resilient, how motivated you feel. But I think that these are hopefully some of the ones that resonate with you. Um, and, and I think that they're more common than we realise. Um, and particularly, we're hearing lots and lots about imposter syndrome and toxic perfectionism um, as well. So what what do we do? So I think that the conversation so far has been um, relatively kind of conceptual, um, you know, and uh, it's, it's important to kind of have a think about, you know, what, what we can do practically. 
I think that some of the things that you know are important can seem really basic um, and you know before I go into them I'm conscious that um, I'm, I'm in a role in well-being which I think very often on the surface can seem fluffy um, but actually you know it takes a lot of time and effort to look after yourself and to build resilience to build motivation it's very worth it but it also means that actually sometimes we have to strip it back and get back to basics um, and do some really simple things that can kind of reset where we are so that we can feel like we are able to build that resilience and we are able to build that motivation so one of the things which i think is kind of one of the most useful exercises that we can do and it's useful not just you know with resilience motivation but generally if you're somebody that experiences a lot of stress is to visualize and have a think about what are the things that stress you what are your stressors and there's this really really interesting concept which is you literally draw like you know a sort of a funnel shape and that's your stress container if it fills up with things and it gets too high you're going to burn out you're going to experience poor mental health but then there are things that you can do that decrease the things that you've got kind of in your stress bucket um so you know draw yourself kind of, you know, your stress bucket and write down on one side, what are the things that contribute to that? You know, recognize what are the things that stress you out? And you might feel like that list is endless. Um, and I'm sure that for all of us, it will be a long list. But when you start to see them written down, you start to think, well, you know, is that something I can avoid? Is that something I can deprioritize? Is that something that I have to do right now? Um, and the more that you see that you've got lots of these things in your stress container, the more you're likely to get to the stage where you'll be experiencing poor mental health. I think that um, there's also, you know, things that can empty your stress container. So, you know, what is it that makes you happy? What is it that makes you feel relaxed? And I think that something that's important to, to recognize as well is that one of the one of the best things I think that I have learned for myself and my well-being is saying no. And that seems really simple. <laughs> and, um, you know, we all know how to say no, but actually it's this recognition that if there's something in your life that is contributing to you feeling stressed, that is contributing to you experiencing poor mental health, it's OK to avoid those things. Within reason, obviously, I'm not saying that, you know, if every time you have coursework, you get stressed out, it doesn't mean that, you know, you shouldn't be doing any coursework while you're at university. But I think it's more the concept that, you know, for example, for me, social media, particularly LinkedIn, and I could see that there was a comment about it. I struggle with LinkedIn because it is a platform where I think everybody looks super successful and it really makes you experience imposter syndrome because you think, how how is everyone achieving all of these things for 24 hours in a day i i can't do that you know i need to push myself more to get to their level so i have to take breaks i have to detox whether it's from instagram whether it's from facebook twitter whatever whether it's from linkedin even though for me it's been a really really positive professional experience and, and you know fantastic way to connect with people sometimes i have to say i'm not going to look at that for a bit because actually my stress container is getting a bit full and i know that that's not going to help me so if there are certain things that realistically you can avoid, um, you know, if you feel that you would benefit from having a night into yourself rather than going and, you know, engaging in some social thing that you feel pressure to engage with, allow yourself to say no, if that's what's going to contribute to, you know, you bettering your well-being. There's also, I, I suppose, kind of the obvious but not obvious, which is looking after yourself. Um, if you are sleep deprived, if you are dehydrated, if you are really, really kind of, you know, eating things that are not going to contribute in any way to your well-being, generally, you're probably not going to be feeling great. And when you're not feeling great, when you're not looking after yourself, where are you going to find the strength to build resilience and motivation? Where are you going to find the strength to, you know, deal with things that come your way? I think that What's important to kind of note here is that I personally don't believe in rigidity around things like, you know, forcing yourself to eat a really strict diet and, you know, never having chocolate and never having a glass of wine if that's what you want and that you have to go and run a marathon a day. I think different things work for different people. If on occasion that chocolate bar is going to make you feel happy, that's self-care too. But I think generally on the whole, you just have to think about obviously how you treat yourself physically has a really really big impact on your psychological health so obviously kind of within moderation I don't think you should be kind of stringent with any of it but 
you know, think about if you're sleep deprived, maybe that's what's impacting your motivation. How can you find the energy to, to do something which is stressful or boring if you are feeling like you're not well rested? Are you getting enough time outside? There's loads of research that says that, you know, experiencing green spaces, experiencing sunshine, getting out and breathing fresh air has a really, really big impact on our psychological well-being. And if you're in a better place, psychologically and physically, you're going to be in a better place to deal with what comes your way and also to kind of take on uh, the motivation that you need for whatever it is that you want to achieve. That said, I will share personally, um, <laughs> I'm very, very bad um, at looking after myself, uh, which is not great as a well-being lead because I know that I'm supposed to practice what I preach. But I'm, I'm, I've really struggled to kind of get out of a habit of going 110 miles an hour, waiting to burn out, being sick for two or three weeks and then starting again and again, ramping it up to 110 miles an hour. I'm really, really trying to enforce within myself the importance of sleep. I chronically just don't sleep enough and I know that it impacts me making sure that I am managing to kind of get outside, trying to go, go for walks. I hate running. Um, so <laughs> I think, you know, that's not for me. I know for lots of people that's helpful, but also finding the things that work for me. There is not a one size fits all. I don't think that you could put together a well-being plan that would work for absolutely everyone. You have to find the things that you enjoy and that work for you and work for you and your personality type and what you have access to. But I think, you know, just to reinforce the idea that, you know, we're all human. Um, and I know that that's that's a weakness of mine. I think it's, it's really important that, that we do reflect on that. And it's, you know, as I said, it's not easy. It takes time. Um, but it is important to kind of try and make some of those changes, which I think just give you a really good foundation for then dealing with that next level, which is that resilience and that motivation. I think also, and again, I'm really conscious that this as a concept might come across as, as fluffy, but there is something really important about finding purpose. So I, again, really important to be realistic. I'm not saying that it's realistic for every one of us 24 hours a day for the rest of our lives to do only the things that we find meaningful. We have to pay bills. We have to go through, unfortunately, certain social conventional things, um, you know, that, that we might not love and we might not find meaningful. But, it, you know, that's just part of life. But what is up to us? And what we have control over is how do you spend the time around those parts of life that we find challenging when we have those spare moments? You know, do we use that to do something that really is going to be incredibly rewarding for us personally? And it's important to discover, you know, finding purpose. Well, what do you want your purpose to be? And I think that it's only through kind of investing some of that time and effort into trying a couple of things which might be meaningful for you or things that you might be interested in to discover what it is that you are motivated by. You know, could you be lacking motivation because you feel like you're going down a path that isn't right for you? And again, I'll share a bit of my own experiences twofold um, with this, you know, in that I, when I was at university, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I was interested in HR because I like people, but human resources as a topic is very broad. So then when suddenly I got to having to find a job, I was like, well, I don't really know where to go with this. It's so broad. You know, what do I do in HR? How do I narrow it down? And to be honest, I think, you know, I, I really needed to kind of, you know, support myself financially. So I, I was, you know, desperate to, to find a job. So I kind of just, you know, tried to, to go somewhere that I went for a job. I had a dreadful time looking for jobs. I think I applied for like 112 jobs before I actually managed to get one hopefully that makes anyone who's going through the job hunting process feel a bit better um but you know i ended up working in early careers recruitment for the first couple of years of my career so recruiting graduates interns placement students first in the legal sector and then in the finance sector and it was enjoyable work you know i really like interacting with young people you know it was really interesting having been through an assessment process then looking at it on the other side um but it was when I started volunteering at the bank to co-chair the mental health network. And I found that that was really so purposeful for me. It was such I felt so driven to work in the mental health space. And that was something voluntary that I did on top of my day job. At some point, I realized, actually, this is what I want to do full time. And if I hadn't had a go at doing that sort of on the side, I don't think that I would have discovered that and you know maybe I would have been perfectly happy still continuing where I was or somewhere else um but you know it's it's 
now I feel so driven and passionate by by my work that it's almost disruptive you know I'll, I'll wake up in the middle of the night and think I've got a really good well-being idea and you know I must write it down so um but you know in in, in a really positive way I just I just feel really passionate about what I do so I think that that's um important to have a go at things even if it's just little things that we do when we do have some spare time to kind of find what it is that gives us purpose and it also doesn't have to be sort of your professional life where you find that purpose so it might be things that you do in your personal life something that you do on the weekend that really kind of provides you with that meaningfulness there's also this element of um reflection so you know when when we think about kind of our, our challenge around you know why aren't we resilient why are we lacking motivation is it because we're not thinking about you know if we've been through xyz reflect on that and either go down a different path or approach things differently in future that might impact how resilient we're feeling there's also i think sometimes a tendency to look back a little bit too deeply in the sense that reflection is important but you can't dwell on things that have happened because it stops you from moving and it's very very demotivating when all you're thinking about is i wish i'd done that differently or i wish things had gone differently that way and again i guess to to, to share some personal experiences and also a moment of <laughs> vulnerability um as i mentioned at the start of the session i used to be a competitive ice skater so i have a background in sport and uh, I stopped skating actually when I was at university um, it was sort of second or third year where I thought it's just too much to balance kind of a, a competitive career with academic life and then when I left university I started working I looked back on that decision and I was so sad and kind of regretful because I missed competing that I spent a lot of time in quite a dark place not and you know not really appreciating where I was in that moment because I was so busy thinking about you know why did I do that or why did I do it that way or why didn't I do it you know some other way and actually it wasn't until I thought right I've reflected on that I have to live in the present and I have to move forward that I then found other ways to get back involved with the skating world so it could still be part of my life just not in in, in the same way and when I was in that dark place I couldn't do that because it was too painful because I felt just so full of regret that I thought well I, you know, I can't live in the skating world because that's that's too challenging for me so I think that there is something about reflection can become a little bit too intense so reflect but make sure that you are kind of you know taking notice of what's happening in the present and thinking about what you want to do going forward and also I think that one of one of the biggest challenges generally around kind of motivation in particular and resilience to a degree is that you know going back to that concept of, of sort of toxic perfectionism really often we set ourselves these these huge great expectations or goals of what it is that we want to do and procrastination which i think is a really big symptom of feeling demotivated or you know feeling like we're not resilient really often is because what we've decided is that we want to achieve this great big thing but it's so big that you don't know where to start or maybe because we put so much on ourselves maybe you want to do 10 things at once where do you start when you've got those 10 things to do and then you put it off and then you know you've put it off so then you put it off some more because you're worried that you've put it off and it really is a snowball of, of just not getting started not getting stuck in because actually the scale of what you're expecting yourself to do is massive um, so I think that that's that's really important. You know, I, I know that you've probably heard so much about it through your academic careers. You have to set smart goals, you know, but that's applicable to, to life. It, it, it really is. You have to set yourself or set yourself a big goal, but make it a series of small goals. Um, there's a really, really fantastic illustration that I've seen of this concept, which is two people side by side and one of them has a ladder in front of them and it goes really high but you know the gaps between the rungs are absolutely massive and you know the person is standing at the bottom scratching their head thinking I, I can't reach that first kind of you know bit of the ladder and you've got someone next to them has a smaller ladder tiny tiny steps and they're already halfway up it because it's easier for them to climb that ladder and I think it's a really really good analogy for for you know kind of the the procrastination piece and kind of how we can help ourselves by setting smaller goals so also something about clarity so you know let's say your goal is to be successful and you're trying to find motivation to be successful how do you define success you know what what does that look like where's the clarity of 
how you get there because where's the clarity of, of what you're aiming for so vague goals aren't helpful but on the topic of success I think that there's also a really really important kind of thing that we all have to do collectively that I think is generally kind of a societal challenge at the moment which is that I think that sometimes there's a little bit of a weird definition of success so very often and certainly I hope that this resonates with others on the call because I think that you know this is something that has been huge for me and I think it's a really really big symptom of things like imposter syndrome and toxic perfectionism when we think about success let's say you're you're coming to the end of your degree and you're thinking about what to do next very often our success can be created by looking either side and looking at our peers and thinking well what are they doing I either have to do the same or better or equally you think well what will people think if you know this is what I achieve what will people think of me if this is what I go on to do next if this is kind of my professional path um, so I think that there's there's also something about redefining what success means to you um, and that it doesn't have to be something that is just for the sake of what other people will think of you I think there's also some kind of introspection that you have to do and again you know it relates to that finding purpose defining success as something that is going to be meaningful to you and again I know that that's not always realistic um, but I think that it's important kind of ethos to think about as particularly when you're kind of thinking about that recruitment piece I wanted to talk about the support piece because I think that you know there's lots of things that we can do ourselves and I've seen there's a few pop-ups in the chat around you know if you're feeling overwhelmed write it down I really support that you know if you've got lots to do and you know can you write it down and try and prioritize number things but there is also something about supporting one another and finding others who can provide you with support um, so it's not just about the things that we have to carry individually ourselves and it comes back to this concept around resilience that I don't love which is that it's your responsibility to make yourself feel better it's okay to lean on other people and to look for, for help and support and you know what do we mean by a support network that could be your friends it could be your family it could be your educational institution it could be your workplace it could be a charity it could be you know a club that you join it could be somewhere that you volunteer but essentially the definition of a support network is people that you can turn to that can provide you with you know a listening ear even you know somebody who you can kind of lean on if you're going through a difficult time and if you're looking for that motivation and you know it's important to open up that's often the purpose of a support network you can share what you're going through um, and you know often when we're feeling demotivated when we're feeling we just don't have that toughness that you know resilience comes with it can also be you know partly because you you're isolated within yourself you're closing off and you're kind of you know keeping to yourself the experiences that you're going through but it can also be because we're scared of admitting what we're feeling might be scared of that kind of vulnerability and for example that can come from things like toxic perfectionism from imposter syndrome or generally from stigma that kind of exists in society around some of that vulnerability so some of that you know what we were talking about earlier so opening up within your support networks is, is really important some of the ways that you can seek support and um, so I mentioned that until I started in the workplace I found it really hard to, to kind of get consistent uh, mental health support one of the kind of most important supports that I got and I wasn't very good at using it because I was using it in secret was actually the uh, counselling service offered at Westminster so if you're a current student and you feel that that's something that would help you honestly it, it can be really really pivotal in providing you with some help to keep yourself afloat your counsellor your support network it's somebody that you can talk to when you're going through a difficult time it might be turning to your friends and you know dropping the facade or looking beyond kind of the social pressures that we see around us to for things always to be going well and saying you know actually I'm having a really really difficult time can I share with you what I'm going through and I think you know more often than not you'll be so pleasantly surprised by how receptive people are to provide listening ear. if you don't feel that that's something that you can do there are also some really really fantastic services that are external um, really often charities will provide fantastic support uh, there's an organization called student minds which focuses specifically around some of the challenges that 
people who are studying go through. The Samaritans have a 24 hour helpline as well. Um, you can also text them if you don't feel comfortable, if you're not in a situation where you can use the phone. So 24 hours a day, there is somebody that will respond to you if you are struggling. I think that that's so, so, so powerful. Um, also, you know, it's it's a little bit of, of self-promotion, but I promised that it's selflessly, but thriving from the start is a network that is intended for people that are either in education or kind of going through recruitment processes or in the first couple of years of the career, regardless where they study, regardless of where they are um, working, it's designed to be a community to provide you with some support and education around mental health so that, again, you don't have to feel that you're alone so you can get involved with thriving from the start if that's something that's helpful for you. I think something that's important to acknowledge um, in this context as well as uh, you know something that I went through is that there's a lot of cultural differences around uh, opening up to family so I have a fantastic supportive loving family but they are from a country where mental health isn't societally accepted um, you know even now so you know it's, it's very different to talking about mental health in the western world so I was worried about bringing it up because I wasn't sure how they understood mental health and, and what would happen so there are definitely kind of you know cultural things to be aware of where you may feel that you're in communities where it's more difficult to talk about these things in which case you know use the resources that are available either at the university through the nhs or through the charities like student minds like samaritans mind is a fantastic charity as well city mental health alliance do a lot around this piece as well um, and if you're looking for kind of, um, I suppose, uh, not immediate support, but maybe support in the context of building skills, so building skills of dealing with stress or dealing with difficulty, things like breathing exercises, mindfulness, there's also an organisation called This Can Happen. If you literally Google This Can Happen webinars, they have a whole list of things, which also includes things like how do you deal with exam pressure? So if you're currently a student, that might be something that you want to kind of have a think about um, utilising. And, you know, webinars are a fantastic one because you can do that in your own time. Um, you know, and, and I think one of the challenges with seeking help or kind of opening up to a support network is that really often you can be in that kind of um, place where you are maybe worried about, is it the right time to seek help? You know, uh, you wait for permission for somebody to tell you, okay, now you're unwell enough to seek help. The moment that you feel that you're not feeling great and you think that opening up someone or seeking some support would be helpful, go for it. Do not wait for someone to tell you that you're in a position where, okay, now it's okay. Um, you know, only you know how you feel. But I really think that the earlier that you can get support, the better. And I think that also it's, it's really, really important to kind of distinguish that we will all go through periods of time where we are feeling demotivated or we feel like we're lacking resilience. Again, I think that's just part of life. It's really, really difficult to consistently, you know, always feel that you feel motivated and you feel resilient and everything's fantastic. Life batters you sometimes. But that's different to struggling with your mental health in a significant way where it might be a diagnosable mental health condition. So worth just kind of being aware of that educating yourself maybe through some of the websites that we've mentioned before around what is depression what is anxiety how do you make that definition and if you're worried at all about your mental health reach out to some support the last thing that i'll say on this is that we've spoken about kind of how do we as an individual seek help and you might think oh you know she's talking a lot about mental health resources and it's not something that i need right now given the statistics that we know so even if we ignore that, you know, this demographic that I'm specifically talking about, the World Health Organization considers that one in four people every year is going through a mental health challenge. So again, huge reaching, loads of people that are impacted by kind of mental health challenges. And that might not necessarily mean that they have a diagnosable mental health illness, but it might mean that they're going through a period of poor mental health. Maybe they're lacking resilience. Maybe they're feeling demotivated. Even if you right now are on top of the world, it is really, really important that you think about all of these concepts, you know, the idea of looking after yourself, the idea of how your physical health might impact your psychological health, the peer pressure, the social pressure that we might exert on other people, the things that we post on social media, and also the avenues to support, because you never know who in your life might be going through something like this. And maybe tomorrow a friend will say to you, I'm looking for some support. Can I tell you about where I'm, what I'm going through? 
And if you've taken a chance, you know, have a cup of tea, spend five minutes, um, you know, uh, just looking at the websites that we've mentioned today. When you come to those conversations, you'll feel better equipped to, um, you know, to, to share some support, to, to tell people where it is that they can go to build some support networks and kind of have a think about it. But also think about who you might be a support network for and the way that you can kind of influence um, their well-being as well. So um, that's it from, from me on um, resilience, motivation, and of course, I uh, couldn't avoid getting mental health and well-being um, in there. So um, I think now um, back over to you, Justin, if, if there are any questions for me. Yeah, thank, thank you so much, Anastasia. And um, thank you for such a good presentation. I think we're quite aligned on um, lots of our beliefs around, around resilience as well. So yeah, I'm fully on board with your approach. And your, your take on it rather than this um sometimes the commodified you know just work harder faster stronger for longer which i think is a terrible idea um so thanks a lot for the presentation really excellent um, insights in the topic uh, we've got quite a few questions so i'm just going to pull those up and i've organized them a little bit into um into themes so you talked earlier on about vulnerability and that was um it was an early, early part of your talk, and I think it's a really important part. And Narmeen um, asked, could you provide some insight about kind of how to be vulnerable, especially with all the stigma around mental health struggles? And Leonardo kind of adds another flavor to this, which, which is around, you know, showing your vulnerabilities can be a negative experience, and people can take advantage of and use it against you. So how... So there's this kind of showing your uh, vulnerability, um, but how you show it in in a, in a kind of safe way, I suppose. And you responded a little bit to this, but could you talk a little bit more about that? Of course, yeah. So thank you. Really, really good questions. Um, I think that you have to make a decision for yourself about which vulnerabilities you feel happy to share. Um, and I think that if you know you've decided actually I, I would like to share some of my vulnerabilities. Firstly, there's kind of this question of who would you like to share them with? Um, so, you know, is it somebody that you feel safe with? Is it somebody that you trust? You know, there's no suggestion that you should, you know, go and speak to a stranger and, you know, absolutely share with them the most intimate details of your life that are, are vulnerable to you. So I think that there is something about, you know, understanding, are you talking to someone who you trust, that you feel safe with, that you feel that you can share these things with? And you can trickle in some kind of, you know, elements of vulnerability. And I think vulnerability can be as easy as just being honest. So, for example, you know, how many times have you been asked the question, how are you? And you say, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Or I'm fine. I'm just tired. When in reality, maybe you're not fine. That's a good way to test the waters of, you know, share a vulnerability. Actually, I've had a really bad day because this morning X, Y, Z happened. You know, you can, you can start to kind of get a feeling for, um, you know, what is that person's reaction going to be like to your vulnerability and having shared that slight little thing do you feel safe in that context and that might help you to identify actually which people do you want to share those vulnerabilities with and I think that that's really important because if you can test the waters if you can really make sure that you're speaking to someone that you trust and feel safe with um, you know you're less likely to be taken advantage of um, I know that that definitely can be a worry and that can feel like um, a stigma but I think obviously depending on what it is that you'd like to share um you know my experience has been that people have always pleasantly surprised me um i think that you know the reality is that we all have vulnerabilities and you don't know that something you might say might resonate with the person on the receiving end and that might encourage them to open up but i think start small um and definitely kind of have a think about you know within kind of the context of my life who are the people that i'd like to share some of these vulnerabilities with who is it that i might feel safe with and it might be a response to maybe there's somebody in your life that shared a vulnerability with you um so that might be kind of something that that is an indication that actually there's a reciprocal kind of two-way thing where we're both sharing um you know some of these experiences yeah i agree and i think one of the dangers is if, if you have no one that you can ever share a vulnerability with that can lead to um, a kind of build up like a pressure inside, which can which can be quite uh, toxic, as you, as you as you said. Um, you you also talked about about imposter syndrome, and there was some interest in, in that. So Dawn was talking about um, well, she was asking the question, where do you think imposter syndrome 
stems from and, and what kind of causes that feeling in in your experience and, and your your thoughts that's a good question as well um you know I, I think there's probably not a one size fits all in that there are lots of things that can kind of shape us that can impact you know our experiences with things like imposter syndrome i think that one of the challenges though and, and this is you know just my personal view that there's lots of things societally and kind of, I suppose, in, in some of the structures that we go through kind of, you know, right from when we start the educational journey all the way through to you know when we retire that can encourage things like imposter syndrome. Um, and I think that it is, you know, closely linked to this concept. But I think we do a lot of comparison. We do a lot of looking at other people and thinking, you know, they're very successful or they're doing all these things. And when you compare, it can make you really question your own knowledge um, and your own expertise. And I think, you know, I received some really, really fantastic advice around, you know, if you're struggling with imposter syndrome, actually write down all of the things that you've achieved as if, you know, and then look at it as if it's somebody else. And, you know, I think that really puts into perspective that actually, we achieve more than we realize it's just that quite often when we're doing that comparison of looking at other people we don't have a moment to pause and think actually you know i am where i am because you know i've done this or that and you know i've i've achieved all of these things so i think that it is really important for us to kind of have those moments of introspection because i think that unfortunately there is just something about that comparison piece which I think that we see a lot of kind of societally generally so I wouldn't be surprised if you know there's an increasing number of people that are experiencing things like imposter syndrome. Thank you thanks for that answer I think it's really helpful. Um, I had a question and, and, and it links to something that someone else has said and it's, it's what do you think about the kind of commodification of the resilient professional and can that do more harm than and uh, Danielle has, has come in with, with a question that kind of relates to this a little bit. I think it's a, I love the way they put it. Uh, you should be, they said you should embrace your vulnerability. It's a raw human experience and, and they agree. But how do you apply that in, in environments? And, and the terminology, which I think is brilliant, is the doggy dog private sector industries, consultant investment banking, Fortune 500 companies, you know, these ruthless, what, or what can be seen as really ruthless um, corporate environments and I know we've done a lot of work with um, chief execs and that they can be pretty tough environments at times so how, how do we mitigate against that of this being almost misused so I, I think you know there's there's kind of two things there the first is that I think we have to for ourselves reframe what we mean by resilience so I think that you know that commodification of you know tough you know business person or you know what is you know this successful workplace person that's always resilient I think that is important that we kind of take on board some of the criticisms that um you know I've, I've tried to raise today around actually the challenge with resilience is that you know often the concept is that you you just you just have to be tough and th the onus is on you for when things are you know challenging but there are elements of resilience that are really important so you know this kind of mindset that well we can't control what happens to us but we can control our responses whether that's emotionally psychologically physically um so i think that you know when when we look at those kind of you know ideals of you know this this resilient um you know whatever successful person if we can frame for ourselves well i can be resilient but what that means for me is that I can't control what happens but I can control how I respond to it and I'm going to look after myself and I'm going to make sure that I'm in the best place possible to deal with um, you know anything that, that comes my way um, I think that that's important because generally I guess commodification also is that you, that you are sold something that isn't always attainable so I think that it's important to kind of um, keep that in mind I think for the question around the the corporate world I think that you would be surprised generally around the approaches that organizations take so i would say that kind of you know things like the consultancy sector is different to even where it was five years ago and i think that you know i, I don't want to rely too much word, uh, too much on the buzzword of the pandemic but actually the pandemic has sped up a lot of the kind of changes in attitude towards things like well-being in the workplace there's also an element of you know, I think that 
you as a population as, as people who are studying and and maybe looking to kind of enter or re-enter the workplace um you know within the next couple of years or maybe you've just re-entered you are the talent that organizations are looking for and actually you have more of a voice than you realize if trends shift towards you know people searching for employers that are going to not just accept it as a given that you know you, you you are in a doggy dog world and that you know things have to be tough and that you you can't show vulnerability so again i think it's about thinking about re, re, reframing for yourself what do you think success is does it have to be that you have to become an investment bank or is it that you can look for for example a smaller investment or asset management firm that actually you know does more of the kind of you know health creation and kind of health understanding for their employees i think that we have lots of choice now and those choices can define the patterns that organizations make in terms of how they they you know approach things like this um within kind of their workforces um so so i think that there is something but i mean ultimately if, if that is something that you want and you do find yourself in an organization where kind of within the context of the workplace you don't feel that you can show that vulnerability or you feel that it is incredibly intense i think then it becomes really important to consider what you do for yourself beyond that it doesn't have to be necessary I, I think it's important to show vulnerability in the workplace but if you don't feel comfortable there are other spaces in your life where you might be able to share those vulnerabilities. Um, so I, I think there's there's a balance there depending on on if, if that is definitely something that you want, finding those other spaces for the vulnerability and, and for kind of self-care, but also considering that there's a lot of power in making choices around, you know, what you define success as, but also where you end up, um, you know, choosing choosing to, to start or, or continue your career. Well, I agree. I think uh, I've noticed huge changes. Um, I think that sometimes some of the sectors that have been talked about, uh, actually they're doing fantastic work. And some of the sectors that are more dog eat dog are the ones you wouldn't expect actually. So good leadership is really recognizing the importance of this and taking it seriously um, and leading by example. I know when we worked with Microsoft, the chief exec led by example and, and that filtered down. So there was a real, uh, a real kind of taking it seriously because they recognized that the you know the, the staff the, the colleagues are the most important asset in a company um so yeah it's really good to hear that um there were some questions around um we've got maybe a time for one more maybe two more um helping others so uh, maria talked about specifically uh, helping the parents struggling with mental health and i've added a bit of just others other people that you love and you care for or that or that you like um Sometimes they might not take it seriously, or as you as you mentioned, it might not be culturally uh, culturally um, common for, for this to be taken seriously, uh, and there might be stigma around mental health, and, and there definitely is uh, in, in 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 all in all cultures really. Um, so how how might you help others? And I think you've talked about this a little bit, but you know what kind of tips? would you give in helping people others yeah so i think um there's there's kind of two sides to the question and i think the first thing that i'd say is that I, I will talk about kind of how how to offer support but i think that what's really really important is um boundary setting in that you know if someone does turn to you for support it's important for you to recognize what you can offer them but also your limitations you know I assume that no one on the call is qualified as a psychotherapist. So, for example, you know, you, ca you can't take the place of someone's counsellor. I think there's a lot to be said for equipping yourself to understand, for example, you know, is it a case of what does the process look like if you would like to speak to your GP and seek some therapy? What's that going to look like? There's loads of fantastic information on the NHS website around what's that actually going to look like? What does a referral look like? You know, what do you talk to your GP about? What will they suggest? What will your first appointment with your therapist look like? So equipping yourself with that kind of information, understanding, you know, what might depression look like? What might anxiety look like? What does bipolar disorder mean? Um, can go a long way for you to be able to effectively guide that person to some longer term support that you might not be able to offer. But I think obviously there are things that we can do um, to support that person, but also day to day to kind of, you know, if, for example, let's say we have a friend that's struggling with their mental health or is looking for some support, what are the things that we can do? Some of my top tips are firstly asking people how they are twice. 
So research suggests that when you ask someone how they are the first time, you're not going to get an honest answer. So, you know, it's a case of ask them again, uh, maybe not immediately. Don't just say, how are you? How are you? Um, you know, maybe you say, how are you really? Or um, actually, I've noticed that you're not yourself. Is there anything that you want to talk about? You know, are you really OK? Um, so I think that that's that's really, really important. Um, as you say, Justin, uh, I think that actually listening is super important. And actually, I can really, really heartily recommend uh, there's a free online training by the Samaritans. It's called Wellbeing in the Workplace, but I think it's applicable to everything that you do. It's modular, it's online, so you don't have to do it all in one sitting. But essentially, it teaches you active listening skills. So there's a there's a saying that as humans, when we listen, we're not actually listening to what the other person is saying. We're thinking about what we're going to be saying next. Um, and acting as a skill that you can develop actually um, is, is really important in, um, you know, actually providing a conversation where you are allowing that person to express what it is that they would like to express. Um, I think that there is also, um, you know, something about sometimes when we talk about that concept of um, sharing our vulnerabilities, you create this sort of permission for the other individual to open up to you about how they're feeling. So really often we might notice behavioural changes in friends, colleagues, peers, might be an indication that they're going through something but maybe they don't feel like it's okay for them to talk about it so if you can share a little bit about maybe an experience you've had or how you're feeling or kind of you know open up a little bit you might kind of be able to signal to them that actually um you know they can they can turn to you for support um but i think you know really importantly it's also crucial to kind of understand um the context of the individual. So, for example, I think somebody mentioned, what do you do if it's a parent that is struggling um, with their mental health? What do you do in that case? I think that it's important to recognise they might not be in the same situation, might be a bit older, maybe a slightly different context. You know, is there a recognition of the set of circumstances that they're in, um, which is important, and that can enable you to be kind of a good uh, active listener as well. Um, so I think, you know, set set the kind of tone that it's OK to talk about these things, that you are open for that. Try and upskill yourself and allow yourself to be able to kind of listen um, actively, um, you know, and, and in a productive way and also equip yourself with what can you offer for that person to seek in terms of longer term help. Very helpful. Thank, thank you. Um, so uh, Shiv Shivam wanted a, a tip on what you, what you, what, as a former recruiter, what tips would you give regarding your first job? And Damien's added an, ex an, ed an extra bit to this, which is, aren't we all forced to show the opposite to recruiters or companies uh, when it comes to how we present ourselves? Are we encouraged to feel like imposters or present ourselves as perfect. So I think this relates to Shivam's uh, piece around how do we do this, starting off from like the perfect CV, uh, it makes them feel inadequate sometimes rather than being proud of what they've achieved. So how, how, as a recruiter, how would you, how, any, any tips and advice you'd give um, the, the students and the recent graduates around going for these jobs and being your whilst going for these jobs and maybe not falling into the trap of presenting yourself as some uber resilient uh, energizer bunny that will keep going at all costs until you're completely burnt out yeah i mean fantastic questions i'm i'm gonna um kind of speak to damien's point first which is i think that there is maybe something about you know when you're preparing an application i completely honest, i think recruitment processes generally can be really demotivating i mean as I said, I had so many rejections when I first started to get my job that, you know, it's it's difficult to think of yourself as good enough if, if all you're getting is these emails telling you, sorry, unfortunately, we're not proceeding with your application. Um, when you go through applications, I think it's actually a really good opportunity to do some of that reflection piece. So you've got in front of you, you know, an opportunity to write down all of these things that you should be, you know, totally proud of, you know, any experience that you've had that has contributed to you being the person that you are now, I think, is an important one to, to embrace and to celebrate. So, you know, maybe it's a case of when you're filling in your CV, when you're filling in your application form, looking at it and thinking, actually, look at all of these things that I've done. Look at, you know, all of my hard work that's paid off um, and, you know, trying to kind of reflect on that as a positive. I completely take the point, though, that, you know, there there is an issue, I think, with workplaces 
really kind of driving this messaging that we're looking for the best and we're looking for perfect candidates. And I know I, I completely appreciate that maybe for any of you who are going through the recruitment process right now that it's, um you know, this isn't going to be particularly reassuring, but there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes to challenge this kind of thing. So increasingly what we're saying, what we're seeing is, for example, employers are signing up to commitments, for example, public commitments that they are saying we want to improve how mentally healthy our recruitment processes are. And one of the recommendations with that is to take away that notion that you have to be a perfect candidate in order to get the job. So I think that, you know, we will start to see employers that have made these commitments, making changes to some of the phrasing that they use to really stop reinforcing this message that you have to be perfect because, you know, none, none of them are, are perfect, you know, uh, employers themselves, you know, they're not employing just, you know, only perfect people because that's that's just not possible. So I think that there is something about, um, you know, watch the space because I think that there's a really big push. And the report that I mentioned around young people's mental health that was launched um, yesterday by the City Mental Health Alliance, which is on their website, if anyone's interested to have a read, is very, very distinctly focused, not just at talking about the current situation, but sets out really, really practical examples for organisations of what they can do to stop this kind of you know stigma of perfection that currently exists and actually you know if, if you are in the job seeking process and you're worried about some of that stuff it's worth doing some research about what kind of organisations are signing up to these commitments which organisations have contributed to studies such as the one that was launched yesterday because more likely than not those will be employers that are trying to kind of actually really really change the landscape of, of what they're doing in this space so I, I, I take the point, Damien. I think it's, you know, incredibly tricky. Um, in terms of um, tips uh, as, as a former recruiter, it's really hard because unfortunately there's not a golden ticket. There's not something that I can say to you that, you know, is going to guarantee that all of you um, are, are going to get, you know, the, the job uh, exactly that you want. I think that there is, um, you know, something around um, not being afraid of sharing the experiences that you've had if you assume that maybe they're not relevant. When we look at application forms, they are a really arbitrary way of us to get an idea of the person that's behind the form. So the more flavour you can provide for who you are as a person, you know, the, the, the more that we can understand whether we feel that, you know, you've got skills to contribute to, to our organisation. So, you know, I've seen students that will um, skip out on experiences that they've had maybe because it's not quite in the right sector or maybe because um you know you think well it's not relevant work experience this is a job that i did because you know i was supporting myself financially put it all in because the more that we can see of who you are as a person the better that we can kind of make an assessment of you know uh, you as a candidate um i think generally quite often candidates fall down on uh things like um you know that are quite basic which I know happen because really often students will be submitting so many applications at the same time but it's things like you know are your responses to questions like why do you want to work here too generic so a tip hopefully that is helpful is that if you're reading an application that you're submitting to an organization and you can take out the organization name and replace it with another one and it still makes sense it's too generic and recruiters will, will absolutely pick up on that um, you know, do your research, make sure that you have taken a scan and proofread your application because, of course, we're all human, it's absolutely fine. But, you know, when there's lots and lots of mistakes in, in application forms, unfortunately, the implication is that there's been a lack of care. And obviously, we want somebody that's taken the time to, to kind of really, um, you know, uh, do, do a good application. Um, and, you know, finally, I think that, you know, there is... Um, uh, you know some importance in really making sure that you understand the organization and really fortunately they're so public about so many things now it's very easy to you know have a scan of the annual report have a look at you know what have they been up to in the press so I think it's just not enough now to say I know you're an accountancy firm and you've got offices in you know x locations and I'm really interested in locating you know accountancy and international uh, you know collaboration what have they been in the news for? You know, have have any of their you know colleagues done uh, presentations? Have they done you know interviews? Uh, you know, have have they had exciting deals recently? I think that the more that you can show that you've got an up to date understanding of you know on the ground what, what have they been up to, I think that that can be really helpful in kind of just 
sparking that actually you you have a genuine interest in in that organization so um and a, a really good way to do that if you can't be bothered to scan newspapers is you can set up a google alert, uh, alert for a company name so you get emails uh, every time that they're uh, mentioned somewhere in the press so it can be just a quick scan of your email and then you have an idea as you're writing your application of what kind of things they've been up to recently that's some great tips there I'm listening with uh, great enthusiasm so that's great um perhaps one final question and what top tip would you get do you do for yourself really when you have a a dip in your mental health. I, I too got into this work because I suffered from anxiety, still suffer from anxiety, still kind of feel it as well. When it when it impacts your positive your productivity, what top tip would you give? What helps you? Yeah, so you know, I, I try and do um, a, a couple of things. I think one of the things that I try to do now, which is uh, kind of a very much learned kind of behaviour, is trying to first understand why it is maybe that I've had a dip so is there something that's happened that has triggered how I'm feeling because I think that that acknowledgement of this is a response to something can be really helpful although for anyone that you know struggles with mental illness you'll know that sometimes there's nothing that you can put your finger on sometimes you just do go through a difficult time um I I do think that you know again this is easier said than done and I think it depends on kind of what the reason is for for why might maybe you're kind of going through that period of, of you know worse mental health but um you you have to pause you have to stop um you have to do the things that are going to make you feel happy so that's really really individual it might be that you know you go and you go for a nice sunset walk in a, a lovely green space maybe you have three cornettos you know <laughs> um not saying that's what I do but maybe it is um you know maybe it's that you go and see a friend maybe it's that you cancel all of your social plans and you spend some time on yourself so I think that there is you know just a little bit of pausing resetting and just kind of trying to do the things that make you happy I think that it's also a really really important time to kind of take stock of if you have support networks in place maybe letting them know that actually I'm starting to, to feel that I'm on a decline. So keep an eye on me or, you know, can we have a chat about it? Um, and, you know, equally, it's it's some of those things that definitely contribute to, to kind of your psychological um, kind of state, which is have a nap, try and get a better night's sleep, you know, try and have a think, you know, is this related to anything in terms of, you know, has my diet been really, really bad? Or maybe it's the opposite, maybe... I deserve a chocolate bar or something um so you know i think that there is something about kind of that that self-care piece but also recognizing that maybe it's time to speak to a therapist again maybe it's time to go and see your gp because i think you know early intervention is is super important anastasia thank you so much all i can say is um lucky staff at the bank of england um to have you working with them your insights today have been absolutely wonderful and I, I really think that the students have got a lot from this I know I, I know I have and alumni have got a lot from this so I just wanted to really thank you with a, a deep amount of gratitude um, so thank you from all of us at Westminster it's lovely to have one of our own come back and, and talk to us so thank you very much thank you for having me it's, uh, it's been a pleasure this evening Brilliant. And um, please, for everyone, if you could complete the short evaluation survey, which is in the chat box now, I think, uh, we'll email you a link to the YouTube recording when it's completed and edited. Um, the next What It Takes event, uh, What It Takes to Be a Leader from an Ethnic Minority, is taking place on Thursday, the 28th of October. Lots of, lots of praise coming in for you, uh, Anastasia. I'm sure you can hear it clicking in the background. Uh, more information on booking and those details can be found on the What It Takes website. Um, great to come to that as well. Uh, these events are so useful and um, really thankful to the alumni office for putting them on. Thank you very much, Anastasia. Thank you to all of you that asked some great questions and enjoyed the process. And thanks to the alumni office. Bye, guys.